Central Church, living the gospel of Jesus Christ, being God's love with our neighbors in all places. Joy at Central is being together for friendship. And being together for fun. Joy at Central is caring for one another. In the home or in the hospital. Central is a place that you can call home. Where everyone has a place. And there is a place for everyone. 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 Central Church, across from the Cider Mill in Endicott, serving around the world.
morning, Central Church. For those of you who don't know me yet, I'm Pastor Michelle, and it is my joy to welcome you here to this time of worship this morning. It is a great and glorious day outside, finally. It may not be going back to fall after all. It is a good day to be together as the community of faith. It is a good day to come and worship God and celebrate our faith, to sing together, to pray together, to nurture each other in our spiritual journey. So welcome to worship. May the Holy Spirit fill us and fill this time together. And a second, good morning, Central Church. It's a pleasure to see everyone here this morning. We welcome all who are in our sanctuary, and we also welcome all of those who join us through the medium of television. We hope that you have a chance that you stop in. We'd be glad to greet you at one of their, our regular Sunday sessions. We have just a few announcements this morning. First of all, if you look at the, uh, on the inner center aisle, there are some pads that we'd like to have you sign and pass along. Uh, you might meet somebody you don't know for a change. Be, feel free to greet them. Make everybody welcome here. We are an active church, which you can determine by looking at the bulletin. This week, numerous things we want to bring to your attention. Uh, before we do that, I want to have uh, welcome our first-time visitors. The ushers will be coming down the center aisle, and uh, if you're a first-time visitor, just raise your hand. We have a little gift for you that tells us about our church and the opportunities we have here for you to join us. Today, there's a couple of items in the, uh, that are not in the bulletin. First of all, the pasta dinner was not advertised in today's bulletin, and that's this afternoon from 1 to 4. It's a little fundraising opportunity that our uh, MYF group is doing to help raise funds for their activities, and there is a lot of them. Also today, it's the last Sunday of the month. That means two cents a meal deal. So there will be ushers at the doors as you leave this morning and ask for your donation. That's a regular ongoing program we have here that helps our, our uh, shepherd supper along. Some of the other activities that are to be noted, we have a bridge run next week and Knud Hansen has uh, volunteered to run the half marathon. Uh, when we were talking last Sunday, he wasn't too sure about that, but uh, I got the I got an idea that he's really going to make it, and he's doing a great job. The, uh, if you note, there are some envelopes in the uh, maroon pads. Uh, any donations that uh, are raised just for this will go to our clothing center and to the Shepherd's Supper. Uh, there's also a road rally next week that uh, we want to make a note of. Uh, we've got a minute speaker somewhere wandering around here. I don't know just where he disappeared to, but... Uh... Oh, there he is. He's coming down the center aisle now. Hey, Bruce. Road rally, right? Well, Carl, <laughs> I, you know, I get hit in the head a lot. I'm a boxer, so I get hit in the head a lot. When the fellowship council told me come talk about something, I thought they wanted me to bring in my toad Sally. Right here. How you doing? Doing good. So I'm a little surprised I got to talk about the road rally, but I read the bulletin too. So Sally, what do you think? You gonna come to the road rally? Yep. Ne next Saturday, next Saturday at three o'clock, meet in the parking lot in the back, potluck supper afterwards. All are welcome. So Sally's a good, good toad. I feed her a lot of, a lot of flies and, and all kinds of things. She likes to jump. One of the best pets I've had. But anyways, Sally and I will be at the road rally. Hope you guys can come out for that. And uh, thanks for letting me talk to you this morning. As always. Okay, 
Our second speaker won't be uh, quite that animated, but uh, Donna is going to give us a short talk on the uh, ladies' meeting this week. Hello, everyone. Hello. I'm beginning to think that maybe I should prepare a little differently and had a prop or two. That's a hard act to follow, Bruce. Yeah. But at any rate, my name is Donna Spearman, and I'm the Spiritual Growth Coordinator for the United Methodist Women. And I'm here today to remind some and to tell others about the ladies' retreat. This is our fourth retreat. And uh, we entitled it this year, Everyday Spirituality for Women. And it's going to be held on Wednesday, May 13th, from 9 o'clock to 3.45 or so at Sky Lake. I am really hoping that you'll come. Ask your friends. You don't have to be a member of United Methodist Women. You don't even have to be a member of Central Church. But believe me, you are in for quite a day. And in case you haven't heard, the facilitator for this year is our very own Pastor Michelle. And we are thrilled that she's going to help to develop our spirituality. Also, we plan a full day. There is something for everyone. And if you choose that you don't want to eat, sing, eat some more, do a little Bible study, sing some more, you can walk, take a walk around the lake. In addition to those planned events, our very own Kathy Arrington is going to do a mud cloth <coughs> project, and she promises that it will be so successful, you'll be anxious to take it home and put it on your children's refrigerator. <laughs> <laughs> Our piano singing will be, <laughs> will be led by Carolyn Stanton. And the day will also include a presentation, a meditation from Rachel Leonard from the university. I promise this is going to be a great day. Now, just a little housekeeping. The uh, forms to sign up for the retreat are in the Welcome Center. If by chance you can't find it, call the church office or call me, and I will get one to you. The price is $20 for a full day of events. And of course, as usual, the service will end with Vespers down by the lake. If you choose to walk the lake, you can. I um, wanted to tell you that there is a carpool that will be leaving from the church at 9, at uh, 8.15 on that morning of the 13th. Also, our church band will be going there. Believe me, it's going to be wonderful. This is our fourth one, and I've had a great time each year that I've been there. Think about it. If you have any additional questions, please call me or call the church office. Thank you. Okay. Thanks, Donna. And now we're going to give the floor over to Pastor Michelle, who has an announcement that's probably going the joy uh, section, too. Every now and then, a congregation gets the opportunity to support someone and nurture someone who has begun to feel a call to ministry. Guess what? You're one of those congregations. Allison Clock has for many years now been sensing a call to ordain ministry in the United Methodist Church. She has met with the staff parish committee here she has met with church council here. She has met with the district superintendent. The girl's been to more meetings than I like to think about. It's getting her ready. Um, the organizations from this church staff, parish, and church council have blessed her on her way. They asked some wonderful questions about her sense of call and where she sees herself going. The district superintendent was very impressed with her, and she met with the district committee on ministry on Wednesday and blew their socks off. <laughs> they approved her candidacy for ministry. <laughs> Your job is not over yet. This young woman needs prayer and care and um, your support and affirmation for the gifts you have already seen in her, but also the gifts that she is going to be learning to develop for ministry. This is a very long process. 
an incredibly long process. She has to get through college and then seminary and then a whole ordination process as well. That, my friends, is about 10 to 12 years from now. She will continue to need your care and your support and your affirmation. So I hope that you will covenant with her to be that supporting presence, to be her loving church for the rest of this journey. Will you? Let's start our worship service by joining together in the call to worship as printed in the bulletin. Why are we here? Stirring in each of us is a longing to be loved. God says to that, you are the beloved. In us is our search for a vision larger than the pressing moment. God says you will have visions and dream dreams. God says, I have called you by name and given you each other to love. Let us live in grace. Let's pray together. Loving God, we have been wandering, lost not only in our busyness, but on the journey to our true selves. We have tried that which does not last, followed that which goes nowhere, bought things that do not satisfy believe the lies of our culture. Persistent God, you love us beyond what is reasonable. You search for us in all the seasons of our lives and embrace us as we are where we are. Open your eyes today. Open our hearts to embrace you and to become the loving and beloved people you created us to be. Amen. Let's join together in hymn four oh eight in the red hymnal. Let's turn to one another and greet each other in Christian love.
given all authority in heaven and on earth. Therefore, go and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Teach these new disciples to obey all the commands I have given you. And be sure of this, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. I'd like to invite Kaylee Marie Rando and her parents to come forward. I don't usually do this, but Kaylee is dressed in a fetching white gown <laughs> worn by Millie Jones at her baptism. I know, right? <laughs> We read in the gospel that John, who baptized for the forgiveness of sins, called all people to turn and accept God who had already accepted them. We, the friends and members of this family in the body of Christ, proclaim the same witness here today. This child comes today for baptism, brought by her parents as a witness to their faith that God claims and loves every person as a child of God. So, in this moment, God be with you, and also with you. God brings us to this moment of grace, and for this, we, where is the slide not there? Okay, God brings us to this moment of grace, and for this, we give God praise. <laughs> in baptism, we are marked by God, identifying us to the world. We come into this moment naked as a baby, expectant as a child, to experience again a birth through water and grace and spirit. We come to this second birth with waters to remind us of all the waters in our story as God's people. The waters of Noah's time, when God redeemed the world and blessed its new life. The waters of the Red Sea parted 
swept away, making a path for freedom. The waters of the Jordan, making way for Jesus, baptized by grace and by the Spirit to his life of ministry. The waters of home and everyday living, carrying us each throughout our own lives. We honor those waters as we pour out this water today, offering ourselves to God once again, asking God to claim us again as God's people, as we remember that we too share the waters of baptism and the birth of the Spirit. And so, Holy One, we ask your blessing today on these waters and on the one who receives them. Work your grace in her life as you work it in ours. Bless the life and love that will grow in her and bless the family that commits her to you today. This is a mighty gift you offer. May we receive it today with a grace worthy of people who call ourselves your own. And so I ask you on behalf of the community of faith of all times and all ages, do you promise to raise this child as God's beloved child that she might turn from the spiritual forces of wickedness and reject the evil powers of this world? And do you promise to raise this child that she might turn to God whose eternal love we embody today as it was embodied by Jesus the Christ? Do you, friends and members of this congregation, turn again from the domain of death and to the God of eternal life? And will you be as the body of Christ embodying that love to this child as she lives with us in service to all of God's children? She was crying a minute ago. I remember. Oh, she's asleep. Shh. It's okay. Shh. That water got cold. <laughs> Kaylee Marie, I baptize you in the name of God, the Father, and the Mother of us all. And in the name of Jesus, the Christ. And in the name of the Holy Spirit, God present with us at all times. In the ancient church, the sign of blessing was to lay hands on the person being blessed. And so I'm going to invite you to lay hands on Kaylee with me. I'm going to invite you to imagine that you're laying hands on Kayla, uh, Kaylee with me. Um, just reach out a hand if you like. We're all going to lay hands. Kaylee, may the Holy Spirit work within you, that being born through water and the Spirit, you may be a faithful disciple of Jesus Christ and know his love and be his love in this world. Amen. Aw, you can do it. Aw. <laughs> She has the most beautiful eyelashes. May I present to you your new little sister in Christ. And we're going to sing a blessing as you all go back to your seat. It's a child of blessing, child of promise. It's number 611 in your, bulletin, in your hymnal, but it's hopefully on the screen as well. Shall we sing to Kaylee?
The waters of baptism are here. If you feel moved at any point during the last hymn or after the service to come and remember your baptism and your belovedness, you are invited. There's no fence up here. You can come and touch the water, make a, make a sign of a cross on your hand or your forehead. Remember that you too are the beloved children baptized by water and spirit and grace and love. The waters are here for you too. carried away by baptisms, I lose my brain. Uh, would the children like to come forward? <laughs> Yay! I know, I'm so sorry. I forgot. Hey, baby girl. You make it? All right. Everybody here? Yeah. All right. Danielle's so happy. We have two babies. Right? Yeah, I know. Babies everywhere. So did you all did you all see what just happened up here? Yeah. Yeah, yeah? what happened? What happened? <coughs> what did we just do? Oh, no. We baptized a baby, didn't we? Yeah. Yes. I think Danielle remembered when she got baptized in January, right? Yeah. yeah, see, yes, you did. I see she's nodding at me, y'all. Uh, Hi. So, do you know what that means when we baptize someone? Yeah. What? What? Um, I think. Hmm? Me. What, what, what? What do you think? Daisy, a belly. It's very interesting, she says. She always says that. She's working on her answer, I think. Well, I'll listen to that in just a second, okay? So, so when we baptize a baby or a bigger kid or a grown-up, do you know you could be baptized if you're a grown-up too? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You can. It, <laughs> it means that you, um, well, God already loves you, right? Even, yeah. Even when you're born, right? God yeah. already loves you. So does it mean that God loves you when you get baptized? Yes, well, that too, because God already does love you, but it means that the church recognizes that God loves you, that the church is telling you God yes. loves you too, right? Why does God yes. love us? Why does God love us? Because he loves us because he loves the truth. He loves us because he loves the truth. <laughs> Preach it, baby. Preach it, baby, God. Yeah, yeah right. God loves us because... That's what God does. God loves us, right? Because yeah, God, God is love. love. Right. And, and we bless. And we bless. And you bless <laughs> everything we don't say there. Oh, okay. So God loves us. And when we baptize someone and the church comes together to baptize a child, we say, you know what? We love you too. So Kaylee right there, that little baby right there. I can't. Right? You see her? There she is. Uh, so when we, I know, it's universal. When we baptized Kaylee, we said, you know what? We know that God loves you because God has always loved you, but we love you too. And she's your new little sister. Yeah. Oh, that's pretty cool, huh? You know, all those grown-ups out there are your brothers and sisters too? Yes. Yeah. You didn't know you had such a big family, did yeah. you? But because we're all baptized in, in God's love and we're this community together, we're all brothers and sisters together. We're all yeah, family, yeah. right? That's yeah. cool. And if you are family, you, you know, love each other and give kisses and hugs. You give kisses and hugs and you love each other if you're family. But so, my daddy is sick. Yeah, I'm sorry. So we'll give him lots of kisses and loves, okay? So I just wanted you to, to see a little bit of the baptism this morning and to hear what that means and to know that you're all family with everybody in this room. And I everybody always think that's everybody. 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 everybody is a family. You are brothers and sisters with everybody. And so we're going to end it right now. How about that? 
I mean, your brothers, God loves you and your brothers and sisters with everybody pretty much sums up the law and the prophets and the gospel. So, no, we don't. So, would you like to pray with me before you go back to your grown-ups? Yes. Yes. Okay. So, repeat after me, would you? Can you do that? Especially the birthday girl. Yes. Somebody loves her. She gave her a sash with sequins. So, let's repeat after me, all right? Loving God. Loving God. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for loving us. Thank you for making us brothers and sisters. Thank you for making us brothers and sisters. With everyone. With everyone. We love you too. We love you too. Amen. Amen. Thanks for coming up. You've been a great group today. Great. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. See you later. Be sweet, parakeet. <laughs> the first scripture reading this morning comes from the book of John, chapter 10, verses 11 through 18. I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. The hired hand, who is not the shepherd and does not own the sheep, sees the wolf coming and leaves the sheep and runs away. And the wolf snatches them and scatters them. The hired hand runs away because a hired hand does not care for the sheep. I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me, just as the Father knows me and I know the Father. And I lay down my life for the sheep. I have other sheep that do not belong to this fold. I must bring them also, and they will listen to my voice. So there will be one flock, one shepherd. For this reason, the Father loves me, because I lay down my life in order to take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have power to lay it down, and I have power to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. As we turn to a time of giving and returning our gifts to God, I ask the ushers to please come forward, collect our tithes, our gifts, and our offerings.
All things come from you, O oh God. Please stand. Today's second reading comes from 1 John chapter 3, verses 16 through 24. This is how we've come to understand and experience love. Christ sacrificed his life for us. This is why we ought to live sacrificially for our fellow believers and not just be out for ourselves. If you see some brother or sister in need and have the means to do something about it, but turn a cold shoulder and do nothing, what, happened, what happens to God's love? It disappears, and you made it disappear. My dear children, let's not just talk about love, let's practice real love. This is the only way we'll know we're living truly, living in God's reality. It's also the way to shut down debilitating self-criticism, even when there is something to it. For God is greater than our worried hearts and knows more about us than we do ourselves. And friends, once that's taken care of and we're no longer accusing or condemning ourselves, we're bold and free before God. We're able to stretch our hands out and receive what we ask for because we're doing what he said, doing what pleases him. Again, this is God's command to believe in his personally named son, Jesus Christ. He told us to love each other in line with the original command. As we keep his commands, we live deeply and surely in him, and he lives in us. And this is how we experience his deep and abiding presence in us, by the spirit he gave us. Okay, turn your watches around. We're going over. You'll get it back another week. I promise. This is First John, not John the Gospel, but that little bitty book in, toward the end of the New Testament. We don't hear from this one much, but frankly, this is one of my favorite scripture passages. This letter, which is what it is, is a pastor talking to his churches. He's very concerned about how the people in them are living out their Christian faith. For him, it's, it's not about what they do or even about what they think. It's about how they love. That says a lot to the current church world. You know, we have <clears throat> so-called conservative churches, which I hate these labels, but they're handy. So-called conservative churches that say it's about making the church the center of your life, requiring members to tithe, to attend a certain number of services each week, to pray each day for an hour or more, and that if you don't do these things, you are not really a Christian. You're not living your faith. It's in fulfilling your obligations to your church that you are saved. Or let's swing over to so-called liberal churches. Again, I hate these labels, but, you know. Liberal churches that say it's, it's really about saving the world. Participating in every cause, stretching dollars and people in every direction, or focusing on only one issue or only one action to the exclusion of everything else because it is in saving the world that you are saved. It is in saving the world that you are faithful. Well, this pastor, writing to his churches in the second century, says, yeah, it's about how you love. With that, he cuts right to the heart of the faith. Real love, God's love, the love of Jesus shown in his self-sacrifice, that's what it's about. Doctrine, belief, good acts, building up the church community, all that is good, all well and good. But they mean nothing unless we first love our neighbors. Truly, deeply, madly in love with each other. Well, that's a tall order, isn't it? We don't even get what that means, really. 
You know, we are folks who toss around that word love awfully easily. I love chocolate. I do. <laughs> I love my children. I do. I probably should have put them in front of chocolate. <laughs> there are days. I love my life's partner. I probably should have put you first, Nate. I'm sorry. <laughs> English has one word to describe all of that. Potato chips and my husband are not the same. Yeah, no, they're not. But see, Greek is different. We have to understand this pastor writing this letter in his context. I probably have talked about this before. I know I will talk about it again. But hey, there are five words, at least, at least five words used to describe the concept we call love in Greek. Agape, you've heard of this one, right? Agape love, ancient Greek generally referring to a pure, selfless, ideal type of love. In the New Testament, this is the verb used to describe God's love for humanity. It's also been translated as love of the soul, deep, pure soul love. Eros, you've probably heard that one too. If you took any Greek mythology, you did. It's passionate love with sensual desire and longing, physical love. Eros helps the soul recall knowledge of beauty, contributes to an understanding of another facet of spiritual truth. Lovers and philosophers are all inspired by Eros. Philia. You've heard of this sort of if you've ever been to Philadelphia. It's a dispassionate, virtuous love. It's it's a concept devised by Aristotle, actually. It includes loyalty to friends and family and community, requires virtue and a sense of equality and familiarity, brotherly love. Here's one you probably have not heard of. It's called storge. Natural affection, like parents feel for children on the good days. Xenia. The fifth one, love expressed as hospitality. It's almost, it describes a, a ritualized friendship formed between host and guest who would previously have been strangers. The host feeds and provides shelter for the guest who is only expected to repay with gratitude. It's xenia. The opposite of z is, the blah, blah. I was going to say I'm losing my English, but it's really Greek. The opposite of that is xenophobia. You've heard of that. It's fear of the stranger. Xenia is love of the stranger. So those five words are distilled from over a dozen words for love in Sanskrit, the mother language of them all. And we 21st century folk who somehow believe ourselves to be more sophisticated than the ancients have boiled it down to one, love. When we only use one word for love, we lose the depth of what we talk about when we name God's love for us. Or when we try to understand what the love of Christians for each other should look like. This pastor in this letter is talking about agape. The pure love of the soul. The essence of God's love. Now while I do love and have a great desire for chocolate... It is not a pure, intimate, selfless, soul-deep love most of the time. <laughs> While I love my children, it is with a protective, cherishing mother love, which is different. It contains aspects of all the other, but it is different. Loving deeply, loving pure... Excuse me. Loving purely is what binds us to God. Loving others with that true, deep, pure soul love is what opens us up to this life that God created us for. Loving others makes God's love complete. That's what I love about this passage. Our love makes God's love complete. When we don't love this way, it's simple. God's love cannot be completed fully. 
I think we don't get that in our world. We, we confuse other loves for agape love all the time. I cannot tell you how many of the 83 couples I have married were getting married on the strength of their attraction to or their affection for each other. We are so unfamiliar with what soul love is and we're so fully enculturated to believe that one love can stand in for another that these couples can't hear anything about this when I'm counseling with them in our pre-wedding meetings. How do you love each other? We just love each other. How do you love each other? Well, we're in love. Yeah, I get that. <laughs> can't hear it because we don't Think of it this way. They're just in love. We are called to agape love with others, but we don't know how. This pastor tells us how. Hmm. It's loving like Christ love. Dying to prove the love of God he taught. It's living for others, loving others in a way that makes God's love real. How do we do that? We live in a world of shallow and temporary relationships, casual disregard for others, willful disobedience of the so-called golden rule. We live in a me-first world. How do I deeply love with a pure, selfless love of the soul the person who hurts me to get ahead? How do you love the one who refuses to treat you with respect? How do we love the ones who reject us or abandon us. How is it possible to love that way the one who has abused or injured me? Or how do I deeply love with a pure selfless love of the soul a casual acquaintance or a coworker with whom I share absolutely nothing in common but the job? Or the guy next to me in traffic blaring out the music I really don't like. Or the same clerk I see in the same store at the same time each week. How do I love, agape love, soul love those people? I'm sorry, there's not really an easy answer to that. It might be easier to conceive of loving someone who has not hurt me. But it's still a weird idea to love deeply someone we barely know. That kind of loving has implications. And that is exactly this pastor's point. When we love with this kind of love, we live in God's reality. When we don't love that way, God's reality is hard to find. That seems harsh. It seems impossible. But it's what Jesus constantly taught and showed loving truly madly deeply loving selflessly and purely knowing the beloved as intimately as you know yourself it's not important to be perfect at it that i do know what is important is beginning it what is important is trying Seeking to live that love with friends, with enemies, with acquaintances, with neighbors, with family. What's essential to beginning is understanding that since this is love that begins and ends in God, it's not something we can do entirely on our own. We have to have God's help. That kind of love I'm talking about is not simply love from one person to another, it's it's a three-part love, which always includes God at the center. True love, true agape is the act of bringing another into the embrace of God and letting God do what you can't. It's the only way to love an enemy, as Jesus taught. In fact, it's the only way to love anyone deeply and selflessly. That, tr that kind of love has radical implications. Agape love changes both persons because God is at the heart of it. The sacraments we celebrate in the church are a stunning example of agape love. 
That may seem strange to hear because we, we tend to take them for granted. Communion comes once a month. It's a habit. We'll have it next week. You're all invited. But when we're living in the love of God, living in God's reality, it becomes an act of selfless soul love. The coming together of people into the embrace of God around a table. It becomes a sacred moment, a celebration of abundance and pure love. When everyone is invited to that table, the loving, the unloving, the lovely, the unlovable, all of us there together. Baptism is acknowledging our need for God's love and grace, that none of us is fully alive, fully personified without it. It gives us an example of being, becoming part of God's grace as we share in water and spirit. When we participate in either sacrament, we enter into another time and place with God at the center. An embrace that takes in all of our brothers and sisters of every time and every place. The ones we like, the ones we don't. The ones who are like us, the ones who are not. Takes all of us in, in an act of deep and perfect love. It is difficult to engage that deeply. It is hard work to enter into relationships that deeply. It takes a lot of work to live every relationship that fully all the time. We don't feel equipped to do it, and sometimes we just don't want to do it. But that's the reality we're called to as people who claim the name of Christ. And when we seek to live that way, truly, madly, deeply loving each other, we find that God is present even when we didn't expect it. Equipping us, removing obstacles, making it possible. When we love that way, God is with us and that's the reality. That's the promise of this love and that is the good news. Thanks be to God. Amen. We're going to sing again. Please stand as you're able and comfortable. week and into this world. Know that like Kaylee, you are beloved, amazing, blessed children of God. Now go and love everyone else like that. And may the peace of Christ help you do it. Amen. <laughs>